You're listening to KWOU. Coming up next, the amazing, unbelievable adventures of Dr. Theophilius Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald, the Tasmanian Emu. Have we come to the end of things already? Surely this cliff leads down and out into the sea. For a long time now, I have been down and out. Won't you come with me? Okay, okay, I'll admit it. No more lies, no more duplicity and chicanery. Dispel the smoke and shatter the mirrors, and I'll take bad luck for seven long years, because... If you want the truth, I'm Jasper Beck, and this is The Amazing Unbelievable Adventures of Dr. Theophilius Crux, Ph.D., and his faithful companion Archibald the Tasmanian Emu. In the interest of being honest, I will have you know that I am thoroughly lost. What, did you think that just because all of our favorite characters had successfully made it out of the mist, that it meant that we did as well? I wish. But unfortunately, we're in this together. You and I. I couldn't tell you the last time I saw their faces, those wandering souls without souls. With every moment, they fade deeper into the background radiation of the Big Bang that is my mind, until they are nothing more than abstract concepts of characterization. Not people, not even the idea of people, but the idea of the idea of people, and so on. I miss them, and I'm sorry if that's not the case for you. So... I cannot find my way out of this fog, though not for a lack of trying or lack of vital information. As we both know, I was entirely present for the group's discussion of the nature of the mist, and how one must assert an externality despite it in order to escape. I am fully aware of the fact that my continued search for an externality that I will simply stumble upon is the primary source of my continued directionlessness. No pillar, polygon, or pantheon is going to give me direction beyond the mist's borders. That's on me. Then why am I still lost? Well, we keep saying that, that we merely need to assert an externality. But if we are only asserting for the express purpose of escaping the mist, then aren't we being at least a little disingenuous? How can we rebuke those who are trying to find a way out? and then step out ourselves. If it's only the methods that matter, this self-actualized versus wandering dichotomy, then maybe we are more in agreement than we are at odds. We both hate this mist, as much as it is reality, or lack thereof, and we would both like a way out of it. I guess I can't blame you for wandering, then. It's not the wrong way, it just seems to be the slow way. Did you see how quickly the main characters self-actualized and dipped? Why would you want to remain a wanderer, hoping to stumble upon truth? Well, if I think about it, it certainly requires a lot less work on your part. It's a very energy-efficient way of going about things, as long as you're chill with the metaphysical and metanarrative morass whereas they have to exert extraordinary amounts of selfhood in order to solidify, you're running pretty darn near close to zero self. At least, that's what it looks like from my vantage point here, separated from you infinitely by a definitively impenetrable void. Surprisingly, though, I don't think I'm wrong, and I always think I'm wrong, or at the very least self-contradictory. In any case... I think they were wrong to make fun of you, those existentialists and those main characters. We are in the same boat. Being lost is just another way of being found. What all of us, turtles included, can't understand are those peoples who have never been in the fog to begin with, whose existences have only ever been concrete and stable. Have they no consciousness? The existentialists are quick to laugh, but I think they laugh ultimately because they are afraid. 
Without even speaking, these butchers and bakers threaten the authority of the misty picture of life the existentialists have painted. Perhaps we are the fools, their doubt whispers. Watching the fisherman cast his lure carefree into the stream, content with whatever it brings him. Perhaps they only scream, assert, assert, because they too were once fishermen, angling around, trying to find the truth, but it had turned out they simply weren't very good. And bitter from years of biteless boredom, they snapped their poles and declared fishing tomfoolery. Hence why they would be scared of the barber and bricklayer. What if they had caught a fish? The whole thing falls apart, doesn't it? Perhaps... We are then simply a confused breed, unable to navigate through a world that is well mapped for others. And we fight amongst ourselves, each declaring the other out of touch with reality, when in reality we are all out of touch. And that's the point. Maybe we should stop trying to be like everyone else. And not in the high school sense of the phrase, maybe we should stop trying to be as a verb in the manner of everyone else, that we have a distinctly different being than them, not better or worse, just different. It is a being that allows us to be out of touch rather than condemns us to be out of touch. The dreamlike quality of it all that we had so come to hate is in fact a boon. It allows us to take out our eyes and examine their contours. So when we declare that we cannot find a way out of this labyrinth, I think we are actually stating our greatest strength rather than our weakness. Or perhaps they are one and the same. And it's so funny that in my newfound desire to embrace the fog, I should find the capacity to leave it. In order to get what you want, you have to not want it. Isn't it funny how that that is neither sad nor a paradox. I stand here now, enveloped by clouds, on the threshold between realms. And I'm happy, for the first in a long time. I'm glad you're here. Let's see what the characters are, have been up to, shall we? We open... On a grand vista, a spectacular establishing shot that establishes nothing beyond how awesome and breathtaking it is by itself. You know what? Yeah, it is awesome by itself. Even without description, or perhaps because it has no description, it stands alone in beauty. I can only describe it as indescribable. It needs no narrative, no context, no swelling musical score. It is but a panorama, and you are caught up in its splendor. The camera then cuts to an entirely unrelated shot of an infant in a playpen, and then cuts again to yet another cafe some 11,000 miles from both of the previous shots. Editing is a fine art. Matt Brown, being Matt Brown, interjects before the setting can be properly established. Isn't it a shame that one has no perception of time while caught in the fog? I mean, surely it's a tragedy of the utmost order that we should have waltzed out of that self-doubting deluge of delusions, only to find that the ticking time bomb that is the ground we walk on has gone on ahead without us, leaving a meager nine days to be enjoyed. He looks around to his companions, failing to find their concurment. Luce sips his coffee, truly a tragedy of the highest order. Mrs. Now Hatter, now wearing a hat, sips her coffee. Of course, you'd be the one to be totally unconcerned about that, Luce. I think you lack the context to be profound at this point. Luce shrugged, as he often does. Ah, that's all right. I'm fine with taking a back seat for now. I've had my run. Well, good. I should like to at least revisit my backstory before the world does end. I would hate for my only characterization to have been my flight from my own characterization. Aw, look at the little heroine, cooed Matt Brown, afraid to be an unmotivated character. 
Have you not been consistently reminded throughout the show that the whole darn point is that you lack motivation? That we all lack motivation as a semi-heavy-handed analogy for the existential condition? Augustine set down her croissant. Say the word existential one more time, and I swear on the numinous, I will curb stomp you. Noted, Matt Brown said, eating Augustine's croissant. Fuchsia, how are you? A little check-in on your self-referentiality? Fuchsia gently set down her tea. Am I, am I the only one who's a, a little scared of things coming to an end? Like, isn't it a big deal? Well, of course, darling, but the whole point is that we pretend that it isn't. That's what that sadistic author of yours likes to call humor. Well, I, I don't think it's very funny. Well, I don't think it's very interesting that your previously complex character has been reduced to the sexist archetype of a naive child. What happened to you, Fuchsia? You used to be... compelling. Fuchsia looked down, a bit embarrassed. It's so easy to fall out of love with yourself, with your author, with the world they've placed on you. What in the moment seems like a paradigm shift can turn out to be a passing phase, mere ephemera. Like you've never grown out of being a teenager, and that scares you. Like you're terrified that deep down inside you haven't ever actually changed, and that you are still a thirsty husk groping around for a drop of happiness, willing to go to the ends of the earth for it. Or, that is right up to the ends of the earth before stopping because its abject ending calls into question your mode of existing at the moment, in the moment. And you realize with a pang of emotion too complicated to be labeled as anything except the general heading sadness that maybe, despite what every movie tells you, life isn't about change you already were exactly who you are from the get-go, and it's more about realizing that, accepting that, than it is trying desperately to shove yourself into a chrysalis. And thus, the world has become a lot for you. By definition, the end of it is overwhelming. But you don't say any of that, because you're the naive child now. Might as well play your role. It's much easier that way. Fuchsia sipped her tea. Oh, I don't know anything. I guess I'm still cooking as a vampire. Still figuring out who I am. Augustine snorted. Aren't we all? A poem after the break. You're listening to KWOU. I can't say that I'm sorry for what I did. It's not that I did something, but rather that I am something. I haven't been something in a long time. Surely you understand. I'm so tired of indecision. I can't exist forever in this quantum state of agony. But you saw me, and I collapsed like a house built on sand. I may yet be too close to this now to expound upon it fully. It's a weight no poly can hoist. The holy's got inertia, so all I can tackle is minutia. I'm a tortoise like my new shell. I'm a newborn vampire. Call me foolish. Call me fuchsia. But fuchsia understand what's between you and I. Like twins Gemini, we're friends, him and I. You took me under your wing like I was already the fuselage, forced me into your flights of fancy, so furthermore I refuse to budge. Did you budge it for me? Smudge my name onto a form for me? Forget at what time we ever became homies and hold up. You never asked for my agreement, and if you did, I didn't see it, because you see I had a secret. You're the fish, now I'm the egret. Because I lied to you. 
and I'm never going to do that again. The fact of the matter is that for me it's all been pretend and that I've never felt you in the way I feel now. I got what I need and if you're real, real how, I want to be infinitely close to you and it seems like they're all close to you, like my chosen robes just clothes to you, but I've roamed a thousand roads to you. This is an ode to you. Everything I owed to you, but I gotta own up to it, so pick a bone to pick with you. The onus is on me to call bogus, the ennui's a bonus. I'm a boneless chicken stripped clean by locust for just trying to locate my locus. I'm sure that if I focused, I'd float open like the lotus. Who wrote this? Certainly not me. I'm not a genius, I read this and sip it down like hot tea, I spew it out cause it's scalding, I can't keep it in my mouth, you say why you so salty, but my tongue's all burned out, I've never tasted you, you haven't ever filled my senses, call me a wasted youth, don't you count me on your senses, I don't feel broken. I feel like I'm coalescing. These words that I've spoken, I hope, make you get the lesson. I feel like I was disintegrating, being torn apart. So I'm finally, I'm immigrating to my home within my heart. The band-aid is off. Time to start bleeding. The bandwagon's off. Time to start leading. I can't see the future, so this isn't goodbye. Nothing ever is. You're right. This desert is dry. And I haven't found a drop of water. The group is walking now in single file, making their way down an endless stretch of road quite similar to where some of them had first met. The land is flat and the sky is purple as it always is. Never forget that the sky is always purple. It's the most important thing of this entire show. Nine more measly days, Matt Brown mocks. What to do, what to do. Find the greenhouse huts is what to do, grumbles Mrs. Nowhatter. I thought that was clearly established. Nothing is ever clearly established. That's the whole point. Shh. Fuchsia halted the whole group, as was her solemn duty as leader of the line. Did you guys hear that? Oh, don't start this again, moaned Augustine. No, no. It's This time it's real. And because I'm self-aware of it, it's not as cringe and narrative-driven. Matt Brown wiped his brow. Oh, thank God, we wouldn't want anything narrative-driven occurring in this show. Exactly. Fuchsia slowly looked around. It's the abject nature of this sound that concerns me. Usually they reek quite pungently of narrative tropes, but this one doesn't. Uh, do we know what this sound sounds like? Nope, only the smell. Uh Uh-huh. This one's a little sneaky bugger, forcing me to identify it by scent alone. Fuchsia began crawling around the flatlands on all fours, like in the olden days, trying to root out the source of the sound's stench. The others looked on in apathy. Suppose we left her, said Matt Brown. Suppose we lost sight of her for a moment and were never able to find her again, said Mrs. Nowhatter. Suppose she was tragically assailed by some unknown wielder of moderately heavy boulders, offered Augustine. Why are we contemplating killing Fuchsia? Lou spoke up from the back. Because she's too linear. She frightens us. She doesn't have our ennui, our deadpan delivery. It's not on genre. Since when was anything in this hodgepodge of an adventure remotely near a genre? Well, fair point. We simply mean we don't like her. Well, that's fairly rude, isn't it? The group scowled as one. Maybe we ought to kill you as well. Luce scowled back. Is this the natural extension of all of the mildly bitter grumbling I've heard from you all? Have you let your detachment curdle into cynicism? Have you locked it away and let it ferment into hatred? Do you slather it on your sandwiches? Do you smash it through their windows? Do you feel happy when the world ends? Do you kill a newborn? 
because she is too sincere for you. Fuchsia had found the sound. I have found the sound, she shouted, signaling to the others that she had found the sound. Despite themselves, they gathered around her in the flatlands beside the road to see the sound. Being found, the sound was a found sound, a small little crackle of vinyl with the hush of traffic heard in the distance. It was altogether pleasing in a heartbreaking kind of way. It doesn't look to be too narrative, observed Mrs. Nowhatter. Looks were still very important to her. No, not at all. Matt Brown reached out to scoop the sound into his hand. Don't touch it, barked Fuchsia, slapping away his floundering phalanges. Ow, my phalanges, Matt Brown exclaimed. Can't you see, you fool? This is no ordinary sound, it's a sound bite. You must be careful around them lest you be bitten and have audio pumped straight to your brain. Fuchsia, have you forgotten in your youthful short-sightedness that we are both very much undead and have no such sanguine superhighways to carry the audio? I haven't forgotten, Matt Brown, the unepithetic. You clearly are not wise in the lore of sounds. This I must admit. The audio pumps itself, and in fact your hollow arteries would be the perfect echo chambers for the treacherous air pulsations. I will not deny that I am utterly terrified of my own annihilation. I will withdraw. I didn't know you were capable of being afraid of anything, Matt Brown, said Augustine. I do not speak of it often, and only in ironic self-reference as to deprive it of its power. But the truth of the matter is apparent. For all of, for all of my anti-philosophical ramblings, I lose sleep at night over the loss of my consciousness. It is a pride I covet most preciously and resent reality for ever endeavoring to take it from me. How terrifying it must be for you, then, to see the passing of the next nine days. Matt Brown said nothing. Indeed, he said at last. Luce conferred with Fuchsia, still contemplating the found sound, which now included the sound of crunching footsteps on gravel. What are we to do about this sound, Fuchsia? I think the sound is here to tell us something, Luce. What is it trying to tell us? Breathing could now be heard in the sound bite, over top the other ambient layers. I think it's trying to tell us something about the end of the world. A tumbleweed passed in the distance, late for a meeting with its supervisors. Well, what makes you say that? A small yellow lizard standing three feet behind me. Luce looked behind her. Ah. Hello! said the small yellow turtle, perched attentively atop a turtle who smelled suspiciously of mattering, perched lovingly atop a desert tortoise who smelled suspiciously of authentic Mexican food. Luce crouched down. Well, hello, you three. Are you controlling my friend here? The small yellow lizard smiled. Yeah, we reptiles control everything. Luce chuckled. <laughs> that certainly explains a lot. Do you have a reason to make my friend say that? The sound bite was trying to communicate something about the fast approaching end of the world, or was that just a bit of yours? The former, my good man. You see, we reptiles wrote the prophecy, so we thought it'd be appropriate to create little addendums to help people out with interpretation and scatter them around the map in sound bite form. Wow. So the turtle and the tortoise matter after all. The turtle cleared his throat. <coughs> ah, uh, Actually, I wasn't present for that particular meeting, so yeah, still pretty low on the Mattering totem pole. Oh, that's all right. Mattering is overrated. In any case, if you're here, uh, couldn't you just tell us what the sound bite means? It'd be a lot easier than trying to figure it out. Uh, no, I think you'd better figure it out for yourself. It is better that way. You're right. I think I'd better figure it out for myself. It is better that way. Luce, he's controlling you. You're absolutely right. Luce kicked the reptilian stack and sent the yellowish manipulator careening into freefall, happily accepted by the sagebrush below. The group, sensing violence, broke from their emotional stupor and surrounded the lizard, steeling themselves against his cold-blooded words. Don't worry, crooned the lizard, 
uprighting himself within the shrubbery. I don't need to control you. Are you afraid? Of you? scoffed Augustine. Please. Only a fool would be afraid of me, vampire. I was referring to the end of the world. The curtain is falling fast. Soon things shall be coming to an end. Seeing as your existences are but constructed, does that not concern you? Does it not fill you with the angst that is the signifier of life? It certainly does for me. Why do you think we wrote the prophecy? The more aware you are of the future, the stranger the present becomes. Things start to pass you by, don't they? A thin veneer of, wait a minute, hovers just beyond your arm's length, a plodding tune sounding like sleepwalking in your auditory periphery. A poem seems devoid of context. A soundbite seems full of promise. The real has been knighted by the knot, rising as the surreal to conquer the waking and dreaming realms alike. Terrifying things are as they seem. Remember that. And without another word, the lizard ate its own tail and became a literary device, exiting the sane realm of the unread. The group simply stood there, puzzled by this revelatory intrusion. Of course, there's always the possibility that he's lying, said the turtle who mattered a little bit. Lizards aren't particularly known for being fundamentally honest or fundamentally anything. They're more contextual creatures than anything. The tortoise concurred. Like humans in that regard. Leave fundamentalism to the vampires. They laughed and waddled off leaving our poor five souls alone with the he sky heavy with purple, encircled around by a soundbite, waiting for it to speak to them, as we all often do. The jingling of keys could be heard now, as the steady breathing grew louder over the crunch of gravel and the song of traffic, the crackle of vinyl providing an increasingly syncopated rhythm of clicks and hisses as accompaniment. The creak of a door heralded the entrance into a smaller acoustic space, and the traffic was reduced to a background rumble. In the intimate quiet, a voice could now be heard, singing softly to itself as it moved casually around the room, searching for the source of the strange feeling that it was being watched. The song went. Who can call your flight a fall? Can you see the light at all? Striding ever round the bend Where to start is this the end? Who can call your flight a fall? Doesn't seem that bright at all Spiraling on golden wings Seeking out the olden things Hold tight, hold Hold tight Tune in next week for the next episode. Once upon a time, a man was born, then grew up, then grew old, then grew tired. And upon his deathbed, he realized a single profound truth from his life's time spent growing in this way. He uttered with his dying breath, I'm Jasper Beck, and this is the amazing, unbelievable adventures of Dr. Theophilus Crux. PhD, and his faithful companion Archibald the Tasmanian Emu. You're listening to KWOU.